Tonight, I can't think of a better person to handle this topic than our moderator, Richard Bard. He's the founder and CEO of the Bard Capital Group, a private equity firm. Before that, he was chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City. Please help me welcome Richard. So excited that you get all the answers right. <laughs> I mean, this is perfectly planned. So we all agree we can go home, but no wine tonight, right? No wine. So this should be a, a fun financial series event to, to those of you that, that, that come to the financial series events every year. We just kind of have fun with this stuff. And so we're not going to take ourselves too seriously, but this is a serious topic. And we have two amazing presenters tonight. And, and, and my view is that this will be, we'll try and keep our presentation as short as possible because I think the questions from the audience are really gonna be what makes this a rich and good program. So when you think about what's happened in our, in our, in our world in, in the last 10 years, you know, sort of the, the, the decade of, of 2010 is, is kind of behind us now. And it's kind of a new decade. And, and it seems like it's coming in with with some incredible, crazy things going on. Yeah, but you know, the decade just passed was, was, was no slouch. I mean, the, we became energy independent. We had the Chinese really sort of raise, you know, their whole view of, of, of world dominance, and particularly economic dominance. We had, you know, uh, President Obama opening ties with Cuba. We had Donald Trump being elected. You couldn't have much more Brexit. So, Question is, was, you know, how did this act sort of fit in you know, to all those things that were pretty darn important? And I would, I would suggest that this was one of the meaningful things that happened, that, that sort of happened and most of us weren't really sure what it all meant. So I think having some clarity about that, for one, is kind of fun, uh, but, but I think we all really recognize that this, this unsustainable level of debt is, is really a quandary. So we all agree on it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? So uh, we're going to take you through sort of at least some, some, some facts and, and talk about, and have, we've got some nice you know, charts to talk about, some, some things that may, may or may not surprise you. And uh, then we're going to talk about well, what do we do now? And I think that'll be kind of hopefully the, the fun part about it. So let me tell you a little bit about our, our presenters. You've got, you've got their backgrounds to some degree in the, in the brochure. Arguably, these are the two most experienced and most influential tax policy advisors in Washington. So Hank Gutman was, in addition to being private practice and, and a, a lot of public tax experience, and he also has been a full-time teacher at University of Virginia, where my daughter went, and, and University of Pennsylvania, the, the school that dropped the state, but, you know, but maybe it's Penn, you know. Uh, at Penn, they, they, have, they wear these shirts that say, not Penn State. Um, I'm kind of an avid Penn Stater. But anyway, so I forgot, I've forgiven Hank for that. But anyway, pretty darn good schools. And he was chief of staff. I'm going to have to read some of this because these guys have amazing resumes. He was chief of staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation, the highest nonpartisan tax staff position in Congress. The Joint Committee on Taxation is the official scorekeeper for the revenue effects of tax legislation and advises Congress on revenue, technical, and economic aspects of proposed and enacted tax legislation. So he's sort of the scorekeeper. So if they want to know what's going to happen, then they want to know what happened, Hank's, Hank's the guy that they actually go over and talk to. Uh, he also served as a deputy tax legislative counsel, he's a, he's a lawyer, in the Treasury Office of Tax Policy in the Carter Administration and uh, he has an AB in Public and International Affairs from Princeton, an MA in Jurisprudence from University College, Oxford, and an LLB from Harvard Law School. So he's, he's probably pretty smart. <laughs> he didn't go to Penn State, but he's, 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 he's probably pretty smart. And then Mark Mazur is our economist. We have an attorney with great experience and a teacher, so he's, he's great. And then Mark is our, is our economist. He's the Robert C. Posen, director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Uh, he's a, he was assistant secretary for tax policy 
at the U.S. Treasury Department from 2012 to 2017, so just recently uh, retired from that. He had 25 years of public service, including stints at the Joint Committee on Taxation when Hank was Chief of Staff, he reminded me. The, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, he spent time with the IRS, he spent time with the, uh, the Department of Energy, he was on the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and he was in the, the President's National Economic Council. He received a BA in Financial Administration from Michigan State, one of our competitors, and a PhD in Economics, Business, and Public Policy from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. So these are impressive individuals, and uh, I think we're gonna enjoy talking to them, them talking to you. So I'm gonna, Hank will start by taking us through the sort of basic process of how, how a tax bill gets passed. And it's kind of an interesting thing we never think about. I don't see Hank's in the middle of it. So he's gonna share with us the sort of process of how that happens. Mark will follow with sort of the results of, of the act to date. It's really only one full year of, of results so far. Um, and and he'll, he'll provide us some of the interesting trends of where the US sort of fits into, into global taxation. Uh, and then together we'll talk about the national debt and, and where do we go from here, followed by Q&A from the audience. So, should be fun. Uh, with, that, with that, I'll ask Hank to come up and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take, take, yeah, take your papers back. I need room for mine. <laughs> Got it. All right, you may have your water. I have my water. That's good. Let me get my water. Okay. I'm going to need this water as we get through this presentation. So our discussion <laughs> is a little more timely than we thought it was going to be when we, uh, when we talked about putting it together because we've seen the introduction of a factor, the, corona, the coronavirus, which is going to materially affect the things that we want to talk about. And we're going to save that till later. Uh, as Richard said, we, we sort of had this program divided up into three parts. The first part is to talk about this tax act, uh, how it happened, what it was meant to do, and assess whether it did it. I'm going to take you through the process part of this because it's, you know, I think it's extremely important to understand actually how this stuff happens. Because uh, the rules that govern how we enact tax legislation in the Congress of the United States aren't generally understood and they materially affect the contours of what happens. So it's worth spending a little time talking about that. And when I get done talking about the act and how we got there, uh, Mark is going to take us through uh, an evaluation of the act. And in that context, I want to point out the kinds of things that we, when we're in our policymaking roles, look at as benchmarks to evaluate what's happened He's going to go through them, but I just want to outline them for you briefly now because they will bear on what I have to say as well. Most tax policy thinkers, economists, believe that uh, we should have a tax code that's efficient. Sounds good. What does that mean? Well, to economists, it means that the system is neutral. That is to say, it should not affect decision making. That decision making should be controlled by, in this context, markets. So efficiency is one of the things that we use to evaluate whether a particular provision or piece of legislation uh, is in fact satisfying that goal. Second, we care about administrability. I mean, we have a massive tax system, many, many taxpayers, and the system has to be administered somehow. The Internal Revenue Service does that. But when we're enacting tax legislation, we want to focus on whether the provisions that we are enacting can actually be administered in a sensible way. We care about competitiveness. Now, competitiveness is a very tricky term. It means different things to different people. And the notion of competitiveness in terms of whether our corporate sector is able to compete effectively throughout the world was an important driver of this particular piece of legislation. 
But some of us aren't really sure what we mean by competitiveness and whether the issue of multinational corporations being able to effectively compete is really the most important question. And many would say that really the tax structure that we adopt ought to be designed to promote and enhance our entire welfare of the country. And that we measure whether we are competitive as a nation by comparing us to other countries in terms of our standard of living. Two very different ways of looking at competitiveness. And the, sort of the, the aspect of multinational competitiveness of our corporations was an important driver in this piece of legislation. We also ask, is our system equitable? Well, what do we mean by that? We have two measures of equity. One is called horizontal equity. And the definition of that is that whatever the tax base is, if people with equal amounts of the tax base, we tax income, people with equal amounts of income ought to pay the same amount of tax, horizontally. But we also have a notion of what's called vertical equity. And vertical equity talks about the distribution of the tax burden among various income classes. Now, horizontal equity, that's pretty easy to think about. Vertical equity is a political question. It is the judgment of the politicians as to who should bear what burden of taxation with the revenues that are going to run our country. Then we have deficit concerns. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about deficit concerns. But we worry about that, short-term deficits and long-term deficits. And then finally, something that's particularly true with respect to this act, we would like to have a stable tax system, a system where we can predict what consequences are going to occur when we engage in particular activity. And one of the things that we will see is that built into this particular piece of tax legislation is instability. Now, why? Now we get to the story of how the bill got made, and then we'll see how that happened. So let's start. You, we prepared an outline for you, because it's a little easier to do it if you have an outline to refer to, given the complexity of the subject. And you'll see the outline is divided into three parts, history, objectives, and then the major provisions. I am going to spare you going through the major provisions. Most of you know what they are, and to the extent that they are relevant to our discussion, we'll bring them up. I want to talk about the history and some of the objectives, and then Mark will talk about some of the economic consequences. So, let's get going. The process of enacting tax law is much more complicated than normal legislation. And the reason for that is that there are special rules that apply when tax legislation is being considered. Now, we all know that, uh, at least I think we do, from our civics courses, that tax legislation actually begins in the House, because that's what the Constitution says it's supposed to do. And then, typically, what will happen with any piece of legislation is it will be considered by a relevant committee. It'll go to the floor of the, of the House. It'll be passed. It'll go to the Senate. It will be considered by the relevant committee in the Senate. It'll go to the Senate floor. It will pass. Differences in the two bills will be reconciled in a conference. That is the typical way that legislation passes. And tax legislation, by the way, follows exactly the same route, except that there are some very special rules that apply to it. And the particular rules that apply to it are, uh, are part of the Budget Act. And the Budget Act says that if Congress is going to consider tax legislation that loses revenue, the Budget Act was meant to control deficits, that if legislation is being considered that loses revenue, then there are special rules. What are those special rules? These become very important. The, special, the particular special rule is that the legislation is subject to what's called a point of order. Now, in the House of Representatives, the point of order for revenue-losing legislation can be waived by 50 votes. So it's never an issue in the House because the House is controlled by the majority. House is a very undemocratic place, by the way. Controlled by the majority, 
And the point of order doesn't matter. But when you get to the Senate, you have two problems. One is the normal problem that any legislation is subject to a, what's called a cloture vote, which requires 60 votes in order to stop debate. That's called the filibuster. But in addition to that, the Budget Act says that any legislation that loses revenue is also subject to a point of order, and that's a 60-vote point of order. So there's a dilemma. If you're, using, if, you're, if you're going to enact legislation that loses money, you have to overcome that 60-vote hurdle in the Senate. Now, with respect to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was scored by the Joint Committee as losing $1.5 trillion over 10 years. So obviously, there's going to be a little problem when you got to the Senate. Now, why that bill ended up losing $1.5 trillion is a very interesting story in and of itself. Very briefly put, uh, the driver for this legislation really was the corporate community for years. The corporate community had been saying, quite, quite accurately, that the United States tax rate of 35% on corporate income was way too high. And indeed, it was the highest, but for one, uh, of all of our competitors. And the corporate community said, we can't compete in that world. This, this tax rate is driving us into an uncompetitive position. And of course, if you just looked at 35%, you say, yeah, that's true. However, because of the way the tax law is structured, the effective tax rate on corporate income was about 27%, between 27 and 28%. That's when you took into account all the deductions and preferences. And guess what? That was pretty much the same as the effective tax rate of our competitors. So what were they really arguing about? Well, we can get to that in a minute. But there was something that was even more interesting about it. If your statutory rate is 35%, and your effective rate is 27%. Somebody's not paying very much tax, right? Who wasn't paying very much tax? The multinationals. And the effective tax rate on multinationals' income was somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 or 14%. Now, you might ask yourself a question that I've asked Mark, and I, still, I really don't know the answer to. If somebody said to you, I, I will give you a 21% tax rate, and your tax rate is 12%. Why do you say you're going to do that? <laughs> I've always been puzzled about what the multinational community's rationale for doing that was. But there, there is an explanation, and we'll see it. But in any event, there's a, the, problem, the problem that they identified was a real problem. What is the, what, the notion of horizontal equity is completely violated by a system where some people pay way down here and other people pay way up there. Well, in any event, they had been going after this, the corporate community had been beating this drum for a very long time. And finally, what happens? Well, even the Obama administration, where Mark worked at, recognized that the corporate rate was too high and proposed reducing it, what, to 28, Mark? Uh, 28%? There, there, was no, there was no difference of an opinion that the rate was too high. What was the right rate was something else, and how to pay for it was something else as well. Well, when the Republicans swept the House, the Senate, and the presidency, the, ground, the, the, the foundation was built to be able to move forward uh, with legislation that would satisfy the corporate community. Now, in order to get this legislation passed, however, they had to do something on the individual side. And the individual side is really a footnote to this legislation, which was being driven by the corporate community. But they, they simply would not have had the votes to be able to get the legislation passed had they not addressed individual issues. But remember, the corporate side was the real driver. Well, then they sat down, and uh, back in 2016, before the election, the Republicans in the House had published a, uh, a blueprint, uh, what they called the uh, blueprint for tax reform, which laid out a litany of things that they wanted to do. Then, of course, they captured the Congress, and they also captured the presidency, and they're on their way to be able to do what they want to do. And the, the history of that is laid out for you. The, the, the dates are laid out. I want to go through a little bit of that history, though, because it's important to understand the outcomes. Well, I said to you that 
if we're going to consider legislation that's, that loses money, we have to have 60 votes in the Senate. Well, the, the distribution of the votes in the Senate was 52 to 48 folks. This was not going to pass if there wasn't some way out. But remember, we're dealing with Washington. There's always a way out, all right? And the way out here is a very special, very special provision in the Budget Act, which is called revenue reconciliation. Now, revenue reconciliation is a process which, when followed, puts a time limit on debate in the Senate, and so the bill can't be filibustered. So the critical thing to do here was to get access to this process called reconciliation in order to be able to clear the hurdles that were going to be there in the Senate. And remember now, we're talking about a Senate that's 52 to 48. Now that has another consequence as well, which we're going to see in a minute. Committee compositions in the House are not done in proportion to the representation of the political parties. They're weighted very heavily toward the majority party. But in the Senate, that's not the case. In the Senate, committee composition is proportional. And so the two very important committees that were going to be considering this tax legislation, the Budget Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, the composition was 12 Republicans and 11 Democrats. One Republican changes his or her mind. The bill is dead. But just keep that in mind as we go through. So what do we have to do to do this reconciliation stuff? Well, the House and the Senate have to agree on something called a budget resolution. The budget resolution is simply the spending plan for the next fiscal year. And as long as the two of, two of them agree on it, we have a budget resolution. It's not a law. The president doesn't have to pass it. So the House and the Senate get together and they agree on a budget resolution. Now you can imagine that when you have a Republican House and a Democratic Senate, you're never going to have a budget resolution. But they had a Republican House and a Republican Senate, so presumably they could do a budget resolution. If that budget resolution, we'll put it differently, if that budget resolution authorizes a revenue loss, then any legislation which implements that budget resolution and stays within that revenue loss figure is procedurally protected. So the budget resolution that was passed to enable the enactment of the 2017 Act authorized a revenue loss of $1.5 trillion. Now, how did that get passed? Well, that's an interesting story too. Just, there's lots and lots of stories about it, but. Some of you may remember that a senator from Tennessee named Bob Corker, who happened to be on the Budget Committee, remember 12 and 11? And Bob Corker says very early on in the debate, I'm not going to vote for any legislation that increases the deficit by a penny. At the end of the day, Bob Corker voted for the legislation. How did that happen? Well, because we get into another area that we're not going to be able to explore in detail, maybe in questions you want to know. It. How do we score these pieces of legislation? My group was responsible for doing the revenue estimating. And we use a conventional method of revenue estimating where we take the parameters that are set out by the Congressional Budget Office and we apply them to the legislation taking into account behavioral effects but we do not take into account anticipated or possible effects on the macroeconomy from the legislation that's being passed. That's called dynamic scoring. Well, the administration in particular used dynamic scoring to assert that even though those dummies on the joint committee did it the way they did it, if you did it with dynamic scoring, the bill was going to pay for itself. So it wasn't going to lose any money. And Bob Corker says, well, I guess I'll vote for it. So the vote out of the Budget Committee is 12 to 11. And, that's, and it was tight, folks. It was very, very tight along the way. And the same thing happened in the Finance Committee, where the vote out of the Finance Committee was uh, also 12 to 11. And the vote on the Senate floor was very tight as well, uh, two-vote margin. So it was a very close call. And the process was what drove it to be so close. Now, you say, okay, fine, great. 
we got, we got this bill. How come some of the strange stuff is in this bill? Because if you look at this bill, you will see, and maybe some of you have noticed, all of the individual tax cuts expire in 2025. Hmm. And we have some other deferred effective dates in, in, in other provisions. So this is a pretty weird bill because it really isn't a bill, a permanent bill. What do we talk about? Stability? This isn't a permanent bill. All this stuff expired in 2025. How come? Well, here's the how come. There's some other provisions in the Budget Act that cause a problem. And one of those provisions is that no legislation being considered under reconciliation can have a negative budget effect outside the 10-year budget window that's used to measure the consequences. So what do they have to do? They had to cut off. They had to cut off the benefits in year eight to make sure that they could stay within the $1.5 trillion limit that was imposed by the Budget Act. And by the way, that's not the first time that happened. Some of you may remember that George Bush, second George Bush, proposed massive tax cuts when he became president, and they expired after 10 years as well. Why? Because of this rule in the Budget Act. So you get very, you get very weird things that happen. And unless you understand what the process is that leads to this result, you can't make any sense out of it because nobody in his right mind would legislate like that if they really wanted to do legislation. So there's your explanation for a lot of the stuff that went on uh, during the bill. Now, uh, there were claims that were made with respect to this bill. Uh, in, in your brochure, actually, uh, we laid out uh, what the claims were made for the bill. Uh, just to remind you if I can find it. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have the exact language here, but basically we were going to make the tax code simple, fair, and easy to understand. Hmm? How about that? Uh, we were going to give American workers a pay raise. I think the number was $4,000, wasn't it? Wasn't Kevin Hassett, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Anybody seen that $4,000 pay raise yet? Uh, we're going to make America the jobs market of the world. And not only that, because our current law, because the law that governed the taxation of income earned outside the United States prior to this bill said, we're not going to tax any income of a multinational company that's held offshore until it's brought back into the United States. It's called deferral. Well, there was over $1.2 trillion of untaxed income outside the United States. And Congress said, boy, what we're going to do here is we're going to give them a tax break. Instead of taxing them at 35%, we'll impose a tax of a lesser amount, 15 or 8, depending upon how your assets were held. And we're going to tax that immediately. And all that money is going to come flooding back into the United States. And we're going to have massive investment in plant and equipment. That was the objective. Now, Mark will talk about whether that really happened or not. But anyway, the legislation gets passed. It has these objectives. Uh, it's a very, very iffy proposition to get it passed. It had a lot of claims made for it. And now, Mark, why don't you tell us whether any of that really happened or not? Hmm? Okay, evening everybody. Uh, it's great to be here with you uh, today. Um, I just want to start out with just a quick uh, introduction to the Tax Policy Center where I work just for, for those who, who may not be, be aware or know much about it. Um, Tax Policy Center was founded in 2002. It's a joint venture of Brookings Institution and Urban Institute. They're two Washington-based policy centers. Um, we um, strive to be a nonpartisan and objective uh, analyst looking at, as our name suggests, tax issues. Um, we um, view ourselves as an educational institution. Now, we educate policymakers, their staffs, the public, the media about important tax policy issues. We cover a wide range of issues, federal, state, and local. We try to be timely. Um, one example of that is today we released an analysis of former Vice President Biden's tax proposals. 
Um, so we're at least a little bit timely on that. Um, you can check out that analysis and all our stuff on our website, um, taxpolicycenter.org. Now with, uh, with that out of the way, I want to step back a little bit and look at some of the big pictures on federal fiscal policy. I have a small number of charts that I want to go through and, and share with you today that I think illustrate some important facts. So the first chart um, shows the effective tax burden for all levels of government, federal, state, and local, for 36 countries in the OECD, the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And the basic takeaway from this chart is that the United States is not overtaxed. Uh, if you look at the United States, uh, the red line down at the bottom, 33rd out of 36 countries. Um, the US has a lower effective tax rate than pretty much all of our peer nations. Um, and this is for 2018, but the same basic picture has uh, been, been in, in place for, for a number of years. So the implications that the U.S. is a relatively low tax jurisdiction, also relatively um, small amounts of goods and services compared to these other, these other countries on, uh, on the list. But as Americans, we don't always want to pay for the goods and services that we demand from our, from our government. And the most recent example was a tax bill passed at the end of last year, not the one Hank's been talking about, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from 2017, but a bill at the end of last year that just extended a number of tax provisions that either had expired, some as early as 2017, or were gonna expire. Um, it was paired with uh, increase in uh, retirement savings incentives a little bit. Um, it was paired with um, a repeal of some of the tax, cut, tax increases that were in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed just two years before, and also paired with some repeal of tax increases that were part of the Affordable Care Act that was passed back in 2010. So Congress put all that together at the end of the year, paid for just a small fraction of it. Also, in a budget deal, increased the uh, ability of the federal government to spend on a wide range of, of topics. None of that was, was paid for. So it's not like we're demanding for our, from our public officials that they make the federal government live within its means. In fact, it's kind of, kind of the opposite. Uh, and then the next chart shows this again for the same 36 countries. The US is the 36th country there with the largest budget deficit as a share of its economy of these peer nations. Um, it wasn't that long ago, if you remember back during the financial crisis when the US was lecturing our um, European and, and other nations that they should get their financial house in order and try to live within their means. That's way in the rearview mirror now for the United States. Um, I think uh, that, that job owning no longer is part of the, the messaging of, of, of the US. And right now, as you see, the largest budget deficit is a share of the economy among the major economies. So I guess you can say this is a case of, of American exceptionalism. Um, the next chart I want to show is just looks at revenues and expenditures for the federal government over the last few decades. And if you, you look at this, you see the revenues fluctuate in a fairly small range, maybe 15 to 20 percent of gross domestic product. The uh, spending fluctuates in a similarly narrow range, but, but a little bit higher. Um, typically, when the economy expands, we see revenues go up. When the economy shrinks, we see revenues go down. So in the early 1980s, that's the case, early 2000s. Great Recession, 2007, 2009. Um, the last time the federal budget was in balance was late 1990s, early 2000s. And at that time, the federal government raised about 20% of gross domestic product, so 20% of the size of the economy as federal revenues. And the budget was roughly in balance. Since then, in the subsequent two decades, what we've seen happen is um, the country has gotten older, more baby boomers have retired, greater demands on things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and if we were serious about balancing the budget, we'd go back to that 20% figure and say, well, maybe it should be 21 um, going forward. Instead, if you look at where we are now, federal government raises about 16% of gross domestic product in terms of revenue. So it's a gap, almost five percentage points, that's the size of the federal budget deficit, which works out to somewhere around a trillion dollars. Um, the next chart just looks a little bit at some of the components of 
federal spending. So the bottom red section shows the uh, continued growth of mandatory spending. This is the type of spending that Congress does not have to authorize every year. It's based on longstanding promises. So things like Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid, they're programs that just chug along. Congress doesn't look at them every year, doesn't make changes to them every year. Um, what you see happen as baby boomers kind of retire is the increase in mandatory spending. If you look at the darker red um, section on the top of the chart, that's net interest on the federal debt. And what that is showing is it's moved around a little bit, but in recent years, despite historically low interest rates, we're seeing that a share of federal spending on debt increasing as well. And what that means then for the middle category, the, the oranges category there, um, that's discretionary spending. That's all the stuff that we normally think of as government. We, um, defense, justice systems, education, infrastructure, transportation, spending, whole range of things is in that middle category. And really what's happening is you see it's getting squeezed over, over time. And it looks like uh, we'll get squeezed even going further out into the, into the future. One of my colleagues at the Tax Policy Center, Gene Sterley, um, has calculated that if you look at the projected growth of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt, and you project that out for a couple decades, and you look at the projected growth of federal revenues for those same couple decades, you see that the increase in revenues isn't enough to cover just those four items. And so what that means is that middle category of things that we normally think of as what government provides will be increasingly squeezed going off into, into the future. So with these big picture things in mind, what I want to do is now turn back a little bit to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and kind of follow up on some of the stuff that, that Hank talked about. So as, as Hank uh, mentioned, the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was originally estimated to cost around $1.5 trillion. Um, the Congressional Budget Office did a re-estimate um, maybe eight months or so after it was passed. Um, came out with a number around $1.98 trillion, so almost $2 trillion. But if you think of over 10 years, one and a half to $2 trillion is devoted to this, um, to this tax cut, um, and it's foregone federal revenue. Um, the um, point that Hank also made was looking at the different types of taxes. And so the yellow bars show individual income tax, and you see the big individual income tax cuts year after year after year, and as you get to the end, 2026 and so on, you see it's much smaller because those things expire at the end of 2025. Um, the next chart looks at the distribution of benefits from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, so who benefited from it, who um, ended up paying more. Um, our analysis of the bill shows that the vast majority of American households, 80% or so, get a tax cut under Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Maybe 5% have a tax increase, and those are just for idiosyncratic reasons, that a taxpayer may have large business losses that would be disallowed, or may have paid a lot of state and local taxes and now is subject to a cap on the amount of state and local tax that they can, um, can deduct, um, or a variety of other, other things. But, and, or people who have more than, more than one house and maybe uh, three or more houses that may not be able to deduct all the mortgage uh, interest payments on that. Um, and then um, the other 15% held about, about the same. And then just the last point to, uh, to make here is looking at the um, different way of looking at the, the change in tax benefits. Um, this chart shows lowest quintile to highest quintile. So the lowest quintile is the 20% of the population with the lowest incomes, then the next 20%, then the next 20%, and so on. Um, what this shows in the um, light blue is for 2018, pretty much all income groups get a tax cut, and it's largest for higher income groups. Um, for 2027 on this chart, um, this is when the individual provisions have expired. Pretty much all the income groups have no tax cut, except for the highest income taxpayers, who still will benefit from the corporate income tax and some of the business tax, tax cuts. Um, Hank talked a little bit about evaluations of the tax bill. Um, one of the things that uh, proponents talked about was this inflow of capital to the US. The um, data that we've seen from um, Census Bureau does not indicate that that has occurred. Um, 
Hank talked a little bit about the uh, multinational firms having access to the earnings of their foreign subsidiaries. Um, many of uh, those earnings have been turned back to shareholders, either through share repurchases or, or dividend uh, payments, not so much invested in, uh, in the businesses. Hank talked about the, um, having Kevin Hassett um, claimed that there would be a $4,000 raise for, for individuals. I sometimes joke that either I'm right and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act won't have a big effect or I'll be getting a raise. Um, and most Americans have not seen that $4,000 raise. And then um, the stability point is just an important one, that if you have provisions in the tax bill that phase in, phase out, change over time, it's just really hard for businesses and taxpayers to plan. And that's really something that um, they really need to, to know what, their, what situations they're going to be facing in order to, to adjust to that. So with that said, I want to turn it over to Richard for the next portion of the program. How are we doing? Thank you, Mark. Great. Thank you and rejoin us. I'm not sure I dare. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're enjoying listening. Turn your mic on. How's that? It's on. So I think that you know the uh, <clears throat> the coronavirus is going to is going to make all of our answers possibly wrong. <laughs> that all the logical extension of <clears throat> what we've been talking about and the analysis and the slides you just looked at, uh, when suddenly there's this unknown, very big potential force that's impacting the world and both demand and supply side, it, it, may, it, it really influences you know, what, what tax policy, maybe if you, if you went back two years, which you might have done, and, and also what, what we really need as an economy to continue to grow and compete. So um, with that said, I'd still like you know, address this to, to Hank. So Hank, if you had the sole authority. <laughs> I'm afraid you're gonna ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> I already told him this, so he, he yeah, should he be did. prepared. He if you had the sole authority to change the tax code and entitlements and, and sort of create your view of, of you know, a healthy balance and in, in, in what was fair uh, in terms of, of a tax policy, what would that look like? Well, I guess I'd start off by saying we're pretty exceptional in the United States in lots of ways, and we're pretty exceptional in both our social policies and also our taxing policies. And uh, I think in some ways it's not bad for us to look like the rest of the world. Now. You said, if I, if I could write the slate, what would, what, would, what would the slate look like? You have total authority. All right. And you can, I, I hope nobody's got any weapons out there. <laughs> so here's what I would do. It's interesting. And uh, Winston Churchill once said, the United States gets it right, but only after it's tried everything else first. <laughs> so we have 163 countries that we survey. And it's sort of interesting to take a look at their tax structures. Every single one of them, with the exception of the United States, imposes significant taxes on consumption. They do it in the form of a value-added tax. Now, Mark can give the line about why we don't have a value-added tax. Larry so, Summers. So Larry Summers, a uh, former Treasury Secretary, once said that we'd have a value-added tax when um, Republicans figured out that it was regressive and Democrats figured out that it was a money machine. Um. <laughs> well, that is a money machine. Can be. Uh, so. In the rest of the countries, and uh, there's an OECD slide actually that shows the distribution of uh, the tax burden among various classes. And in most of the other countries that are surveyed, in the OECD at least, consumption taxes are somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of tax revenues. In the United States, they're roughly around six, and that's state and local taxes. Exactly. So another piece of this picture, which is sort of important to understand is that the European countries decided they wanted to get more competitive against the United States. And one of the ways that they did that was by lowering their corporate tax rates. Guess what? We tried to do the same thing. But they paid for that. And the way they paid for that was by increasing their value added taxes and also, interestingly enough, increasing taxes on capital income. Now, why did they do that? Well, 
if you look at a little bit more complicated, take, take a little more complicated slice of how we go about figuring out who pays taxes, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, who really bears the economic burden of the corporate tax? And the consensus view today is 75% of that is borne by owners of capital, 25% by labor. So when the European countries reduce their corporate taxes, they replicate the revenues, but in a distributionally neutral way, or pretty much distributionally neutral. So you say, well, what would I do? Well, I would enact a VAT to start things off. Now, a VAT is a money machine. Now, that raises a lot of money. But with the money that you raise from the VAT, I'll be a little radical here, I think the corporate income tax is ridiculous. It's inefficient. I would repeal the corporate income tax. Uh, and I'm not alone in, in, in the economic world. I'm least. not there. You're not there. I know you're not there. <laughs> That's why this is going to be interesting. But I would repeal the corporate income tax. I would impose a VAT. I would use that, and then I would use the money from the VAT to pay for the repeal of the corporate income tax. But I would also take a lot of people out of the individual income tax rules, low-income taxpayers. Now, one of the things that you need to understand about a consumption tax, though, economists love consumption taxes. Why? Because in a consumption tax, and I'll do, I could do the math for you, but you don't want me to. In a consumption tax, the normal rate of return on capital is not subject to tax. When you translate that into economic decisions, everybody wants to invest because they get a tax-free yield. And economists love it because, as compared to an income tax, this is an incentive to invest. Great, and I agree, that's a good thing. But the small problem is that if that's your tax base, where is capital income taxed? It's not. So you have to have an income tax, but you target the income tax to those folks who are not, are not affected by, if you, will, if you will, the VAT. So my world is a value-added tax, uh, a no corporate income tax, a much lower tax rate income tax on most people, and a substantial tax on capital. And that is the, the, that's, that's the revenue side. But guys, the revenue side isn't the problem. You just look at those charts. If we don't do something about mandatory spending, we're going to go bankrupt. So you, you, got to, you got to ask yourself the question, what are we going to do about mandatory spending? Discretionary spending is going down. Interest charges are going through the ceiling, so you really want to try to get to a balanced budget. But what's the driver of the biggest increase in mandatory spending? We all know what it is. It's health care. So if you really want to address the question, you got to seriously address health care. Now, there are a lot of models out there that one can use. My personal preference is something like the English model, which translated into the United States would be Medicare for all with a private opt-out. But we could debate that. that doesn't, you know, that's, in a sense, that's not even the more important thing. But in, that's the world that I would have, Richard. Come after me, please. <laughs> I'll have to introduce you to my friends in London. Or let Mark yeah. do it. So just, Mark. just one, one, yeah, observation, on. one observation, though, just about that, is that uh, if we look at countries when they um, enacted the a value-added tax, generally their government gets voted out of office. And yeah. so Hank would have to be <laughs> the czar doing that so he That's wouldn't exactly be voted right. out of office. For that. Indeed, the Senate voted several years ago. I think it was a sense of the Senate vote. I think it was 82 to 16 that the United States will never have a VAT. So because Hank, 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 <laughs> these guys like their jobs. <laughs> Hank, why can't we simplify the tax code? What's so, why is that not possible? So just one, one thing, if you think about the types of um, transactions that we all can enter into, there's almost an infinite number of transactions. How we can get paid at our job, how we can invest in um, um, business activities, how we can get paid for those investments. Um, there are so many different uh, ways that you really can't have a simple system that covers all those options. But, but at and the end of the day, they're all income. So why couldn't you have a, a flat tax at a certain level? And so a flat, tax, a flat tax is kind of a red herring in the sense that it doesn't matter what the rate is so much as figuring out what income is. And so you're right, it's all income. But the hard part is figuring out what exactly is that income. Um, if you're a cash business, maybe you think that the income that you're getting on the cash side is really not income. Um, if, uh, <laughs> if you're run, running a small business, maybe you think that some of your personal expenses really should count as business expenses. Um, if you're a multinational firm, maybe you think that 
putting your valuable assets in the Cayman Islands and saying all the earnings for sales in Europe really attribu are attributed to the activities in Cayman Islands is, is the way to go. Um, so it's, it's much harder, I think, than, than, than that. Really just defining income is, is difficult. And that really is a lot of the reason that we have a complicated code. That's interesting. I, I still vote for a flat tax. Um, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the implementation of a VAT, of a VAT would be a whole other yeah. issue, right? So interesting. But so that happens whenever you talk about a new tax, right? So yeah. if you go so, back to like 1913, we implemented an income tax. It took a long time. Um, if you tried to do by right tax, similar. So, so I, help me with the math. I, mean, I think if, if I you know sort of read your charts and and, and your presentations, you, you guys didn't think this 2017. You know, tax cut and job max was was all that great, right? I'll go first. I'll go first. Yeah, I don't so, think it was that great at all. Say, I mean, so, you, 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 your, your, your question sort of leads to something else, which is, well, how come everything? <laughs> I'm getting there. How come everything's still okay? Huh? Yeah, I mean, obviously everything. Why is it, everything, why is it okay? We were on a very good trajectory going into it. It's not clear we needed this. In my view, this is very disruptive and not. Positive. I mean, we're, we're, as a country, we're doing, is arguably doing maybe the best in the world in terms of our economy, in terms of what's going on across our economy through both you know, kinds of businesses and, and, and the demographics and all the jobs and, and pay raises and everything, employment. And, and part of it has to be, you know, I mean, it's hard to measure where the you know, if I tell you, if, you, if I'm a doctor and you tell me you have a problem, mm -hmm. and, I, and I prescribe three different things, and you say, well, how do I know which one actually cured me? Who cares, right? Yeah. So it, it's sort of the same thing to me. I, I think, when I look at, at, we're only into this tax act one, really one full year, all right? And there's been a trillion dollars of repatriated funds come back because of it that went into the economy. Now you can argue that it didn't build new plant and equipment, and I, I, I have a retort for that as well. Mm -hmm. but, but the money didn't just disappear. Okay. So, and and as, as Mark knows, money's an accelerator. Yeah. So you put liquidity in the market one way or another. And, and how, do you, how do you know what the, for all the other things of, of mm -hmm. net tax revenues and, and revenues in the treasury, I mean, what's going on in the economy is really, I mean, particularly when the rest, of the, the rest of the world is not doing well. For us to be growing at the rate we're growing is really fantastic. Yeah. No, so just to, to, to respond to that, I think the stuff that was done on the corporate side, especially a multinational firm, was probably an important thing to do and something that was necessary to do. On the repatriated earnings, I mean, really what happens there is Apple um, Ireland, which has an account at J.P. Morgan in New York, just moves that money to Apple the parent at that same J.P. Morgan bank in New York. So, that money had already been invested in the U.S. economy through the financial system. It really doesn't make the economy any more efficient. It does mean that Apple then can provide a dividend to its shareholders and they can go out and spend it. Yeah. And part of what I think happened in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is it really did lead to a stimulus program. Stimulus program both from the dividends and stock buybacks that occurred and a stimulus program for the tax cuts that went to 80% of Americans. Yeah, I mean, so how, do, so how do we know whether the but, act was, you know, really performed to its intentions, stated, the stated intentions yeah. that were presented to Well, Congress? you see, that, but that's, there's an interesting question in and of itself. I mean, remember, who was it who said that the only thing you should be able to do with your repatriated money was invest in plant equipment? Well, that was your Congress. Did they ever think that maybe there were other things you could do with that money that would have an equivalent or an even better effect? Like perhaps stock buybacks and putting liquidity in the hands of taxpayers. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there's. You, it's not a bad you know, thing. Slice it, you know, take a little slice off that, and sort of blame some people who yeah. made false claims. Yeah, but, but I think you know, it's hard to argue that, that the economy is, is 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 doing is not doing. Well. I mean, Can't, it is doing well. Can't argue that. And you have to assume that that a broad tax cut for both individuals and the incentive for corporations to bring their money back here and build plant here. Or, give money to their shareholders, ha has to have been a major, no. some, some significant yeah. impact. No, that's a, there's a stimulus effect, but it's exactly the same stimulus that we saw in 2009 yeah. and 10 with Obama, when there was a stimulus bill. Yeah. And what it did was put money in people's pockets and they spent it. 
the economy did well. If you look at just the trajectory from 2011 till now, you don't see any break on any important factor at the time the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed. Okay. So before we open it up to the, to the audience, I really want to spend, give the audience okay. lots of time. Okay. Uh, tell us about the coronavirus and, and, <laughs> and assuming you knew about that in 2017, would the act have been different? And right now the Fed's you know, obviously dropped rates 50 basis points and you know my response to that, I thought that wasn't necessarily thoughtful. But um, I think clearly, you know, we're, we're, we're up against both a, a very unique, de both demand and supply problem. Yeah. I happen to think supply is going to be a bigger problem than yeah. demand. So what do you do about it? And, and, you know, if you had a crystal ball, obviously you could have done something. And would, you, would you have changed the 2017 Act to be more aggressive? So a couple of things. I think on the uh, um, tax side of things, there's really not a lot you can do to address uh, potential pandemic uh, on, on the tax side. At the Tax Policy Center, we have a blog that went up last week just talking on this, on this topic. And pretty much it's, it kind of went through, you could have tax credits for pharma firms. Um, you could do a whole bunch of other things. None of those are really well targeted and probably won't have an effect in the short enough run. The one thing you probably could do is on the demand side, if it turns out that lots of people can't get to work because of travel restrictions or restrictions on gatherings, and people don't have enough income, maybe there's a way to use a tax code or send checks to people as a stimulus so they can pay their rent, pay their health care bills, which they really will want to be able to do. You want them to have access to health care and things like that. Yeah, you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, the, we talked about this last night. I mean, the, the, using fiscal policy to address these issues is very dicey. Uh, much like monetary policy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was going to open the floor to Richard. I mean, the, you know, the ability to be able to target fiscal, uh, fiscal policy is pretty, pretty limited. And in any event, the Congress has to act. Right. Now, I don't know whether you trust the Congress more than you trust the Fed, but I know who I trust. And if you're going to try and do fiscal policy, you've got to go through that legislative process. Yeah. And what you're going to end up with is not a targeted tax cut at all, but everybody's, since it becomes must-pass legislation, everybody's favorite thing is going to be in there. And maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. We haven't talked at all about your world. Uh, and we've been talking principally, almost entirely, about fiscal policy. But there's something called the Fed. And the Fed deals with monetary policy and also has an enormous potential capacity to be able to deal with a lot of these problems. And they can do it more rapidly than the Congress can. And I would argue they can do it more surgically. Yeah. Well, they plug, plug for you. Well, they certainly got ahead of this, you know, which, which was you know, in, in itself really historic. Yeah, so I think, I think they're, they're focused on it. And the other central banks are following. So I think that's really all a good thing. But so, I mean, when we say, can we do something with fiscal policy to deal with coronavirus, we're not talking about that really. What we're talking about is, can we utilize fiscal policy to stabilize the economy, which is being disrupted by coronavirus? Yeah. And well, there, well, the, the, just using the fiscal, fiscal tools just is, is too broad and might take too much time. Yeah. Well, well I, th I agree with Mark. I think in the short term, there's clearly not much you can do. But I think the, uh, we should take advantage of the situation for the longer term. And, and I view that as industrial policy. I mean, I mean we, 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 we've given up basic industries. We've given up, you know, it's across the board, including the pharmaceutical industry. So I don't know if everyone knows, but it's something north of 70% of all generic pharmaceuticals are made in China. So in China. tell me how that works. Yeah, in Asia. Uh, yeah. But we've given up, you know, you name it, our, 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 our tools and, and, and uh, um, furniture and clothing and... I mean, we've given up basic industries, and now we wonder what happened to our middle class. And I think the, the longer-term impact of coronavirus is that it's really going to change the dynamics of China. I mean, there, there was already an exit going on. People, corporations were moving to, to Vietnam, they were moving to Thailand, they are moving to other venues, because it was so difficult to do business in China. Yeah, restrictive and politically restrictive. They're stealing technology. 
uh, very difficult place. It was, it was it may have cost less, but it was a, a very difficult environment to, to have your, and even getting your money back that you earned there is, is really difficult. So there was already a trend of, of corporations moving out, and, but now we're gonna talk about an absolute flood. Everyone wants to get out of China. So you're gonna have, that whole growth dynamic of China is going to change. You're going to have people out of jobs. That's not going to sit very well with with uh, with government and politics when when people are unhappy. So you can, I, I foresee some very very strong changes going on in, in the in the dynamics of the, of the global economy. See, it's sort of, it's sort of interesting domestically. Uh, I mean, if if our focus is going to be to try to stabilize the economic consequences of coronavirus. Who knows quite what that is, but there's stuff that's out there that could do some positive effects, like an infrastructure bill, a major infrastructure bill. Yeah, it's, it's overdue. Uh, well, well overdue. Now, guess what? It's pretty expensive. Yeah. So how do we pay for it? Uh, but I think you have, to, you have to consider some of those things that people have said we really should do. Now there's more of an imperative, I think, to try to get them done. And infrastructure just pops to the top. Yeah. And it pops to the top not just because we need it, but also because it has something that's important, bipartisan support. Because, you know, every district's going to get some money, so it's got to pass. All right, Chris, I want to open the, the floor to questions, and then uh, we'll have some fun. And every, every question is open, so whatever you, whatever's on your mind. Uh, not all economists agree that the deficit is a problem. I think of... If I read it correctly, Krugman and uh, some of the other ones say that, don't worry about it. Uh, can you briefly outline their argument and what's wrong with it? Yeah, so th there's uh, an argument that if you take uh, additional dollars in the federal deficit and you invest it in productive activities, so like Hank's suggestion on infrastructure or education or other things that have long-term payoffs, that's okay. Um, and the idea would be that the return you're getting on that investment is greater than the cost of that additional deficit spending. Um, but what we've done in, in a lot of other areas is use it for current consumption. And that's different. And that just says we're borrowing from the next generation so that the people today can have a little bit better life. Um, that's a harder argument to make. And so I think that there's a, a, a subtlety in this when you think about the deficit. If you go back. 20 or more years ago, people said deficit's bad. We had a debt clock, we had all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it's a little more subtle now, I think, where you're looking at deficits, deficit spending for valuable investments, okay. Deficit spending for current consumption, not okay. And there's an, another little piece to all of that, too, uh, which is what is the effect of this large deficit on our ability to be able to respond, for example, yeah. to a fiscal crisis? Uh, What's going to happen? How, where, who owns the great bulk of our, uh, of our public debt? China and Japan. Hmm? That debt's going to expire at some point. It's going to have to be refinanced. Are they going to sit there and say, hmm, I think a 2% return is fine? Suppose they want a 3% or a 4% return. What does that interest rate spike do to everything else? So there are, there, there are issues beyond the long term potentially beneficial effects of deficit financing that we're facing right now in terms of the constraints on our ability to be able to respond to things, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we, we also own a lot of our own debt, yeah. which, 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 is, which is a very interesting query, right? Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. What happens when it comes due, who do we pay? Yeah, yeah. And out of one pocket into the other, yeah. so. But, but, but China can clearly use their, their position to lever us, and they haven't yet, really. They will, I mean. <laughs> but eventually they will. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's, that's coming, so there's gonna be a payday. Other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. So, a question up here. So looking at a chart of uh, US GDP growth from roughly 2010 through current, it's amazingly smooth and consistent in, yeah. in how it grows, whether it's under Obama or under Trump, and my question is, what do you think that would have looked like had those tax increases not taken place? Or tax decreases not taken place? Um, 
I, I, I would say probably around the same. Um, there was a little, I think, a little bit of a, of a stimulus from having those tax increases in 2018, or uh, tax decreases in 2018, so a little bit of a bump up. But I think the underlying um, trend has been the strength of the U.S. economy, and it's generally pretty good shape. Um, I think, as, as Richard talked a little bit about, um, we have a fairly well-trained workforce. We have a fairly good system for matching workers to jobs, for having investments to, to products. Um, and that really is the underlying strength of the, of the economy. One thing that is kind of, kind of uh, interesting, we probably are doing a little bit of that here tonight, is giving probably too much credit to a president and uh, uh, administration for the workings of the economy. Um, there's an effect, but really the underlying economy, the strength of the underlying economy is what drives that. Did Hank want to respond to that question? No, no. I, was, I, I, I wanted to hear your question. question. Yeah, all the questions. I'm tired of hearing myself. Go we ahead. shouldn't have all the questions on this side of the room, so yeah, well, need some over here. But Mark, yeah. uh, there's certainly general agreement that tariffs affect market behavior. Mm -hmm. What is this? Has the Tax Policy Center have a project assessing the effect of these tariffs and tie that in to the farmer bailout? Yeah. And what what is that cost? What money has tariffs raised, and what has been the cost of the bailout of the agricultural sector? So first, we're the tax policy center, not the tariff policy center. So we, <laughs> we don't have we have not done any any analysis on this in particular. But the, your intuition is exactly right in that tariffs are sort of like a tax, and it's like a tax imposed hey, on the importer when the product comes into the into the country. And so you can do a similar kind of, of an analysis with that. If we look at the money that's been collected on tariffs from customs, a couple tens of billions of dollars. If we look at the money that's being paid out to farmers in um, additional crop support payments and the like, a couple tens of billions of dollars. So kind of offset each other. Um, but economists look at tariffs and think of that they're, they're just disruptive. And they're disruptive in a variety of ways, not just... Uh, Farmers' sales to particular countries going down because they're retaliatory tariffs somewhere else, but disruptive in things like the supply chains that people have created over a long period of time, or companies have created over a long period of time, which may no longer work. Um, or even things like getting uh, steel from your um, uh, longtime allies and now having a tariff put on, on that and being unable to get those sources of, of steel and aluminum. Um, that's just disruptive for, for, for businesses across the board. And this gets back to kind of Hank's point about certainty and instability. I think one of the things that companies really dislike is having uh, something hanging over them that could drop on them and, and make what had been a profitable opportunity unprofitable. I think, you know, tariffs, tariffs in themselves were, were not really the, the answer. They're just a means to an end. And most of our trade agreements were unfair to us. So anybody that operates a global company knows that for sure. So if I want to ship something to Brazil, I get a 50% tax. I want to ship something to India, anywhere between you know, 15, 80% tax. I can't do business in, even in Europe. I can't ship something that's, that I build on a Ford, you know, uh, Ford truck because it's not acceptable in Europe. Uh, China, uh, between traveling there, but also, like, at least a 10% VAT and, and a, up to 25% tariff to, to move product from the U.S. to China. Meanwhile, they turn around and dump stuff on us. So I think long run, you know, the, the whole issue of, of using tariffs to really change these uh, agreements is going to be very effective and very positive for us, my opinion. Andy. Yeah. Um First of all, this has been fascinating, but I want to get back to uh, the mandatory expenditures. And uh, we can talk about taxation, we can talk about income growth, but what we really need to do is develop strategies on controlling uh, uh, mandatory, uh, whether it's uh, Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid, and uh, using uh, deficits to pay for those increases every year is, is, uh, is uh, I think, uh, Mark, you've indicated, is, is not the desirable approach long term because it's going to bankrupt us. Uh, 
So just in terms of, of mandatory spending, if you think of um, Social Security spending, one of the things that we, we have now is a Social Security system that pretty much pays retirees for 20 years of retirement, where when the system was set up, it was a much smaller number, right? Life expectancies were much smaller. Um, so you could think of trying to restructure that a little bit, and it could be that we um, increase the retirement age a little bit, maybe from 67 to 68. Could be that we um, subject more income to tax. We used to subject 90% of uh, aggregate wages to tax. Now it's in the 80s. So there's a uh, range to move up from the 100 and some thousand dollars to a higher number. Um, we could um, uh, do some work on, on other parts of the, of the program. Um, we could change the way we do uh, uh, cost of living increase to use a chain CPI instead of a traditional CPI. There are a lot of things you could do. I think if you put a bunch of economists together, they'd say, here are five things you could do it. Unfortunately, this gets back to Hank's point, it probably wouldn't pass Congress. Um, and so it's almost like you need something that looks like a crisis in order to address it. But we're getting in that direction, right? I think that if you just look at some of this information, looking at increases in mandatory spending, which are increasing kind of without limit, then you should look at Social Security, you should look at Medicare, healthcare in particular, what could be done there. I think the, the Affordable Care Act had this goal of trying to bend the cost curve. Um, I don't think that's happened that much. Um, and so mean, probably means that you need to redouble efforts in, in, in that regard. Hank, you have an opinion? No, another question. A question on um, manufacturing seems to be uh, reduced in our gross domestic from about a 13 to, a, I think, 11 percent, they're saying. Um, what's also being introduced is a lot of robotics and automation. Um, and kind of relay with Andy's question, uh, with our Social Security it being based on the working environment of today's workforce, and the introduction of automation into manufacturing, uh, we're not collecting Social Security income off of that. And I know it's probably a small percentage, but if this increase keeps escalating, where do we go? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, uh, an issue that, that a number of folks have, have raised, looking at what's the future workforce going to, going to look like. Um, I think what we've seen over many, many decades is the U.S. economy is incredibly resilient in terms of um, creating job opportunities for people when some sector um, goes, goes down or something is a decline. Um, the question is how fast this could happen. I think if um, you see increased use of AI and um, robotics on a measured pace, you just kind of probably could, could address that, adjust to that. If it turns out that it's incredibly rapid, um, that would be a much tougher adjustment to make. But, uh, another way of sort of thinking about this sort of cosmic question is to just separate things out into two categories, spending and revenues. I mean, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the general benefits, uh, safety net that we've got, it's a spending program. And so is defense, and so is uh, you know, all, all of the other, you know, homeland security, et cetera. If we sort of separate out what we think the appropriate level of spending is and reach a consensus on that, then we have to turn to the other side and say, how do we finance this? And, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of things we can talk about. I mean, that's a, it could be a segue into what the presidential candidates would want to do. It could be a segue into what the administration would want to continue to do. I mean, the remaining <laughs> two uh, presidential candidates would drastically increase the taxation of capital income. Very, very, you know, significantly, among other things. The administration wants to do tax reform 2.0. They want to make the tax cuts that were enacted permanent, and they would like to lower the corporate tax rate some more. There's a real dialogue to be had on the spending side. But I think it's, it, it, it's, it's better, at least in my view, to look at these as sort of two separate problems. And one issue is what do we think is the appropriate level and what's the design of our social safety net? And the other is how do we pay for it? And those always get conflated. And the minute that happens, you lose your ability to talk logically about it, I think. The only thing I'd like to say is thank you very much for your good questions. Thank you.